Okay, I will get started with the introduction. So um, welcome everyone, the, the Association of Computational Engin Engineers and the UT Chapter of SIEM. Uh, we're really happy to host uh, Dr. Jason Fleming today. Uh, thank you, Jason, for, for taking the time to be here today. Um, so Jason is the lead developer of the AdCirc Search Guidance System, which is a software automation system that's used um, for, for real-time model guidance um, for, for hurricane storm surge. Um, this, this system automates um, the running of a finite element uh, shallow water model called AdCirc um, in, in real time on high performance computing, computing systems. Um, and these, the results of this, of this model are, uh, are posted um, so that you know, people can use these, these results um, in the time leading up to a hurricane um, to, to figure out which, which areas are most at risk. Um, and so Jason will be talking about how AdCirc, um, ASGS, and um, CIRA, which is the Coastal Emergency Risk Assessment, um, this website uh, where the results are posted, how these systems come together um, to, to provide uh, guidance, important guidance during the, the critical time leading up to a hurricane. Um, and Jason is also the principal consultant at Seahorse Coastal Consultant. So uh, thank you. Thank you so much for uh, being here today. Um, yeah, we can get started. My pleasure. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to be talking about uh, real-time model guidance for hurricane decision support. I'm going to start off talking a little bit about um, what we do and then talk about the AdCirc model and what it consists of and then uh, sort of give our origin story and, um, and talk about experiences we've had uh, providing decision support for, for decisions that have to be made during, during hurricanes. Slide. Okay, so our, our key activities include co-development, as, as Marco said, we developed the AdCirc Surge Guidance System, which is software automation for AdCirc uh, to control it and so that we don't have to manually do, you know, create input files and, and kick off uh, post-processing scripts and things like that. It takes care of all of that in an automated way. Uh, we have daily operations keeping uh, this automation system uh, running the way it needs to be run on a daily basis, as well as during hurricanes. We have uh, a variety of supercomputers that we run on, including, um, including a Texas Advanced Computing Center. We do outreach and training, including uh, EdCert boot camps and uh, on-site training events and activities, uh, and activities like this, where we talk about um, what we're doing and how we do it and uh, help build community around it. And finally, project coordination, where there are many moving parts when <laughs> a storm is coming and uh, emergency managers need to know where the flood is going to be and when. Uh, and we have a group of uh, academic uh, researchers who know the, the physics really well. And we have people in the field that need to know the answers. Uh, and we have IT and computer science people in, the, in between that need to connect one with the other. So there's a lot of coordination activity. So about the AdCirc models, um, I talked about what we do. Uh, I'm going to switch to the AdCirc model itself. As Marcos said, it's a finite element model. This is a, a finite element mesh uh, that AdCirc uses. Uh, it's tri triangular, uh, triangular elements. Uh, all the uh, all the data is computed at the nodes. There's water surface elevation, uh, water velocity is computed at the nodes. What wind stress and bottom stress are all applied at the nodes. We generally operate this in 2D mode, and certainly for real-time storm surge forecasting, we, we operate it in, in two-dimensional mode. So two-dimensional shallow water equations. Um, EdCirc is a uh, semi-implicit finite element model. So um, with recent, adv recent advances, uh, we we're able to take much larger time steps than in the past. So that's exciting this year. Uh, so a, a typical time step for this model uh, used to be one second uh, as it's controlled by the inundation. Um, this is a close-up of this previous mesh. You can see that as, as the uh, closer and closer to land, the points get closer and closer. Uh, here on land, which I've colored green, it looks like a solid surface, but it's not. It's just that the nodes of the, of the finite element mesh are so close together that you can't see them. And so the time step is controlled when you get into the inundation zone on land. Uh, it's controlled by the, the, the size of the mesh and the inundation rather than the shallow water wave speed. So in the past, we've been forced to take very small time steps, which requires a lot of supercomputing power. Um, some of the work that Dr. Dawson has done is, has been related to 
taking the uh, solution from a coarser mesh and interpolating it onto a finer mesh sort of on the fly so that we can use larger time steps when the storm is away from land and smaller time steps when it gets onto land. Uh, so um, I just want to give a little bit of brief background. I'm not going to talk too much about the internal of the outsert of the outsert model, um, just in the way that we. More, I'm going to focus more on the way that we've used it. So this is an example of uh, of how the adsert model is used to take a real world situation and turn it into a mesh. The adsert, uh, any sort of co coastal finite element model, is extremely data intensive. Uh, the data are are incredibly uh, luminous data sets uh, that are that are captured in order to determine uh, the, the bathymetric depth and the topographic height uh, above the bottom as well as land use characteristics and so forth. This is a, a visualization of a LIDAR data set. You can see uh, how, how dense the LIDAR data. LIDAR stands for um, light detection and ranging which is the use of lasers sort of uh, to ping the, the ground surface either from a plane or from other, from other types of um, aerial platforms to get a very dense millions upon millions upon millions of points all across the land to see what the, what the height is. And so this is visual, visualization of that type of data set. You see these circles going down the dune face, that's more indicative of, of, the, of the level of resolution that an adsert mesh might have in order to make it computationally cheap enough to be able to run in real time. So we have to go from one to the other, uh, not, and not to forget the structures that are behind that dune. So this is the dune line along Grand Isle, and we go back to the previous slide. So this is the map location here in this, this red box. Uh, this is Lake Pontchartrain. This is the city of New Orleans, this is the Mississippi River. So you can see how exposed uh, this, this island is, and this green line represents the dune line. This is that same feature as, as depicted in, uh, in an adsert mesh. Uh, you can see that, so the, the land or the, the part that is above mean sea level is colored green and the part that's below is colored blue. And it's difficult to represent that dune line because it's a subgrid scale feature. In other words, you don't want to drive down the resolution of the triangle so that you can go have dots that go up and over the dune, uh, find an element nodes. So there's a couple of different, different ways you can represent that. You can have very fine resolution, which makes it very computationally intensive, or you can have coarser resolution and just lift up the nodes. And the problem with that is that the shallow water equations being hydrostatic, uh, it's okay when there's inundation at the face of the dune uh, until it climbs up, the water surface climbs up and over and wants to run downhill down the back of the dune. And then, and then you may be violating some of the assumptions of the 2D shallow water equations. So uh, an interesting feature that AdCERC has, uh, an in a innovation which is related to the need to represent man-made structures that are smaller than the smallest mesh resolution you can really have uh, to meet your computational uh, costs uh, that, you're, that you're targeting, is something called internal barrier boundaries, or they're also known as levy boundaries. And what we do is basically cut, make an internal boundary, and we assign a boundary condition that says that as long as the water level is below the face of the dune, there's not gonna be any flux across that boundary. As soon as the water level in the front rises above the dune height, so you have to have a sur survey elevation all the way down the dune in order to compute that, which is one of the very expensive uh, data collection um, requirements. As soon as the water level in front of the dune exceeds the dune height, the NADSERC will compute a, a flux that goes from the front of the dune to another bear, uh, boundary at the back of the dune. And so it's a, a flux boundary condition, but it's a flux boundary condition where you don't specify the flux, NADSERC computes the flux based on the water height. And the, the great thing about that is you can, you can have that be very narrow, much narrower than two nodes uh, with a triangle that connects them. And the downside of that is that you've you cut a hole in your mesh and you put boundary conditions on the inside of your mesh. And so uh, everything, um, it can be difficult sometimes to translate important solution parameters across that boundary uh, other than just the flux. If you want to, if you want to, if, you know, for example, wave energy, you'd have to 
uh, have a wave model that understood that boundary condition and can transmit wave energy in the same way that flux is being transmitted. So there are pluses and minuses. And those are the types of trade-offs that engineers make when they're constructing any kind of finite element mesh requires engineering judgment to construct. And this is one of the trade-offs for, for coastal ocean modeling for, for storm surge inundation. There are many other data types required. Uh, the bottom friction is important. The, uh, so Manning Zen, we normally assign Manning Zen based on land use. Uh, the federal government has a national land cover database that is updated based on satellite photos. And they classify different parts of the lands uh, from anything from sand to marsh to forest to brush to urban. Uh, each pixel gets a classification. Those pixels uh, have a lookup table so that we can uh, determine what, you know, assign a boundary, a bottom friction for the water as it flows over the land for that type of uh, land use. So that, that the Manning Zen is for the friction of the water against the land. We also really care about the uh, friction of the, um, the air against the water because as the wind blows, it, it creates a wind stress on, on the surface of the water, which drives the water in a particular direction. And uh, we need to know as the water gets on land, how much that friction is going to be reduced. How much is that stress going to be reduced versus if it's completely exposed, what we call marine exposure. So that also uses, uh, also uses cover data. And this, so, so that's the, the friction parameters. And then finally, you know, F equals MA, you have a force on the water. And the forces on the water can include astronomical forces from the sun and the moon, which creates the tides. That's one force. Uh, and another force, which is very important for storm surge in particular, is the force of the wind on the water and where do we get those forces from. We can get those forces from uh, geophysical models like the North American Mesoscale model or the Global Forecast uh, System model uh, or the European model, for example, or HWARF. Those are all meteorological models. Those all produce gridded wind fields. Uh, which provide, you know, on, on a, a, certain, a certain amount of resolution, they provide a regular grid of wind, um, wind uh, in the east and north directions and the barometric pressure. Um, however, that's not, we, and we have access to that when a storm is coming, but those models do not represent uh, the official forecast. If you've ever seen the official forecast for a hurricane, it is not a gridded wind field. It's not, uh, you know, U and V velocity of wind on a you know 100 kilometer grid or mesh or anything like that. It is the official word of the National Hurricane Center, which comes out in the form of a text advisory with minimal information in it. Um, this is uh, the uh, as just as an example. This is Hurricane Katrina, a satellite photo of Hurricane Katrina, and the types of information important to the Hurricane Center are uh, the location of the storm, so you get the center of the storm, Latin long, versus time, you know, over the next five days, it's normally a five-day forecast, so you'll have several pairs of lat longs where the eye is going to be located. They give information in each quadrant, uh, how far out the uh, winds of 34 knots extend, how far out do the 50-knot winds extend, how far out do 64-knot winds extend, and uh, the maximum wind speed. And they give that, they give the, the extent of winds in every quadrant. And that's, that's important because, for, for example, for Hurricane Ike, uh, the, the size of the storm uh, varied tremendously as Ike was moving across the Gulf of Mexico. For Hurricane Sandy, I mean, Hurricane Sandy, the 34 knot winds extended out over 300 nautical miles by the time it made landfall. And the larger storm drives uh, a lot more water and a lot more storm surge than a smaller storm. So the physical size is, is extremely important. Um, in some cases, uh, it can be more important than the maximum wind speed. If the storm is very small, it has a high maximum wind, wind speed, you can imagine it's getting, uh, it it's, has a quite different impact. So they give maximum wind speed, one number, uh, the size of the storm uh, with a few different varying parameters and the location. That's, and it's not a gridded wind field. So we have to turn that into a gridded wind field. And, and again, all we're getting, this is the actual text of the advisory. Our, the ASGS has to parse out the information from the text of the advisories. 
And uh, we take that information and we turn that into a curve fit for the, uh, dis the strength of the wind versus direction from or distance from the center. So the way a hurricane is structured is uh, here on the top left, uh, this is a plot of wind speed versus distance from the center. So this is sort of radially, looking at it radially from the center. The, the strength of the storm is zero at the very center. If you've ever been in, been a, hur been in a hurricane, um, it's very violent until the storm uh, you know, makes landfall and the, and the eye is over you and it seems like it's all over. <laughs> you go outside and everything's calm. Uh, and then it seems to pick it back up again. And that's because as the eye wall the, the, the wind speed uh, rises very quickly from, from the eye wall to a maximum. The distance from the storm center at which that maximum occurs is called the R, R max or radius to maximum winds. And then it slowly decays. And so knowing this curve fit, the general shape of it, we can take those shape parameters and the maximum wind speed and we can uh, compute, this is a visualization of the EDSER cortex, uh, we can compute the, the, um, the winds all the way around based on those parameters. And so we're matching what the hurricane center is sending out as their official word, which is not the same as any European model or the GFS or the H warp or any of those. It's a, it's a different, it's a different uh, representation. It's based on the official word. Uh, we have a couple of questions in the chat. I don't know if you'd like to address those now or-, or Yes, like that them. sounds good. Um, so the first question is, uh, uh, so Absol's wondering if curvature effects like Coriolis and centrifugal effects are considered an answer? Yes, so the way, so I kind of oversimplified this, um, the, the shape of this curve fit. So every curve fit consists of um, a functional form and fitting parameters. And the functional form of this curve fit takes into, uh, takes into account uh, the top of the atmospheric boundary layer and whether there's a geostrophic balance or whether there isn't. Some, it depends on the strength of the storm. Very strong storms, uh, those assumptions are satisfied and, and for weak tropical storms or tropical depressions, they're not necessarily satisfied. And so um, the very latest uh, iteration, we've gone through three or four iterations of this parametric vortex model that's in ADSERC and the very latest one looks at those uh, and actually uses a, a trial and error solution to, to fit that based on, on the characteristics. But yes, uh, Coriolis is taken into account is the short, <laughs> the short answer to that. So then the, thank you. And then, so then the second question is, is it worth, is it worth solving the shallow water equations in spherical coordinates uh, rather than working in Cartesian coordinates since we're talking in terms of planetary scale where curvature effects might be considerable? Yes. Um, so the, the way the, uh, in, internal to ADSERC, the, the mesh is, is developed in latitude longitude, but once it's read in, it's converted to a different coordinate system uh, for, act, and this, for the actual solution process. It used to be that was the CPP projection, um, and with the very latest version of ADSERC version 55, you now have the option of a Mercator projection, so um, which preserves the angles, but um, and that's, that's to suit global, global modeling which is uh, also one of the latest developments. Um, so yes, the, the solutions are not in, in Cartesian uh, coordinates. They're, they're, in, um, they're in a different coordinate system from geographic, if that answers the question. Okay. So this is just a quick visualization of, uh, her, this is Hurricane Sandy. Uh, the NAM is a North American mesoscale model. That's on a, actually a Lambert conformal. Which we, uh, which we convert um, for use in ADSERC. And this is a forecast of Hurricane Sandy. So it basically, you know, every, every three hours you get a snapshot of the gridded wind field from the NAM model. And, you, and the NAM model is not, not good for representing hurricanes. And so you can see it's very sort of averaged out. And if you look at the hindcast, which is only every six hours, uh, it's even worse. Uh, this H wind is a product that used to be produced, a wind product that used to be produced by the uh, Hurricane Research Division at NOAA, and it's data simulated. So the hurricane hunters will fly through the storm and they'll collect data. And so they take a, a basic vortex model and then they, they assimilate data into it, measured data, to produce uh, a data simulated uh, full wind field. 
And so that's, this is kind of the best we have for, for Sandy, or at least at the time. And on the right here is, is the hurricane vortex model. Uh, you can see that it's overly sharpened uh, here and it's uh, overly intense here as it, as it gets north. This is the version we had as of 2012. We've made uh, improvements since then, but it does a lot better than, than these gridded wind field models. So, um, so we're, we wouldn't be able to do this without that, without that hurricane vortex model and answer. So if you put all that together, um, this is a this is a visualization of an adsec mesh. This is just a test test mesh. Um, it's uh, I think three thousand nodes, and this was created to sort of test out different features in adsec. It has a channelized river here, which a lot of the rivers are channel. This is similar to the Mississippi River, which is channelized. Uh, these um, subgrid scale. I talked about the internal barrier boundaries, and these are internal barrier boundaries. Uh, so this could represent a railway bed, or it could represent a levee, or it could represent a roadway. But those, a levee and a roadway and rail, railroad bed all look very similar in terms of the way that, that floodwaters react to them. So this is a real ad surf mesh. It's not like a, you know, a um, something I created in Blender or something like that. It's a visualization of an ad surf mesh in Paraview. So this is a visualization of, um, this is sort of a, a sinusoidal tide that's been put on here to show um, how the water moves when when adsec is running and some of the, the features uh, when i put these red particle trackers on there just to visualize the velocity you see as the water rises up and goes up over this internal barrier boundary and gets above it then you see that actually that internal barrier boundary is a hole in the mesh it's not actually meshed over uh, the river runs backwards, uh, and this, this does actually happen. The Noose River here in North Carolina ran backwards for three days before Hurricane Florence hit. Um, and you also see that as, as the inundation goes in, uh, you have areas that are inundated behind these uh, levees and these hydraulic structures. And then as the water recedes, the inundation stays. And so a levee can act to hold back floodwaters. It can also act to retain floodwaters after the storm goes by. And, uh, significant problems in Texas as well as here in North Carolina. Um, we've had a lot of highway construction. Uh, we had Hurricane Floyd, which a lot of areas stayed wet for a long time after Hurricane Floyd went by. And, and, and then again, uh, in Florence, we had the same problem. And in Harvey, of course, uh, things don't, don't drain when uh, in Houston when a culvert gets blocked. And so a lot of the culverts here in North, Eastern North Carolina were undersized for these types of events. Uh, and then in urban centers, they can get blocked and then nothing will drain. <clears throat> okay, so that's that's some information about AdSERC itself and the types of problems you can solve and the types of data that, that go into it and sort of what the output looks like. I'm gonna switch gears here a little bit to talk about how we got involved in doing this in real time. Uh, uh, doing this, these sorts of calculations and risk calculations from flooding and storm surge and return periods and all those sorts of things uh, were going on before Hurricane Katrina. This is a visualization developed by LSU of the AdSERC mesh in, uh, in Louisiana. In downtown. This is downtown New Orleans here. Um, this is the Mississippi River. This is like Ponch Train. Uh, this is the 17th Street, New Orleans Avenue and London Avenue canals. Uh, so prior to Hurricane Katrina, everyone in, in New Orleans and Louisiana knew that there was a problem with the levees, that they were not tall enough to withstand the types of storms that they knew that they could get. And so the ADSERC model was used in offline design studies, uh, specifically Rick Ludic and Johannes Westerink, who are two, the, the, the two co-founders, along with Clint Doss, Dr. Dawson, uh, of the ADSERC model. And so um, Dr. Dawson's involved in a lot of the, um, the Hurricane Ike, the so-called Ike Dyke and other alternatives to that. And, and the same sorts of studies were going on in New Orleans and Louisiana with the Corps of Engineers prior to Katrina. And so what happened was uh, the reason why the flooding during Katrina was so bad in New Orleans is not because the, the levees that were there were overtopped by the storm. That was not, not the issue. Uh, the issue was that uh, the, these canals here in the center that you see in the center, the canal walls failed. And these are not the kinds of canals where you walk up to the canal and you look down into the water and see the boats go by 
down in the water. These are the types of canals where you walk up to the canal and, and you're looking up, up the side of the levee. And then you, if you climb up the, the levee, now you see uh, the surface of the water right, right where you're standing. And so you can stand in uh, at the base of these levees and you can see the barges going past over your head. So this, the city is below sea level. And the purpose of these canals is actually, uh, since it's below sea level, if it rains, it will just fill up the city like a bowl. And so that rainwater has to be pumped out. And that's what the purpose of these canals is that rainwater gets pumped into the canal and then it can flow down the canal and into the lake. So when that fails, if it breaks, the ocean is just gonna come right in and it's not gonna stop coming in until, until the water level in the city is filled up to the same level as like Pontchartrain, which is the same level as sea level. So that was an absolute disaster and it's not something that could get fixed uh, immediately. And so in the aftermath of Katrina, oh, the other, the other problem was during Katrina, they had access to the hurricane center's guidance, which was at a lower resolution than what they needed. It did not contain any timing information like when floods were going to occur or when winds were going to occur and they needed that. And so they said, hey, we've been running this AdCERC model for these designs and it has all of our up-to-date data and surveys in it. And we, you know, we know that it's calibrated. Why don't we have and they're coming, not just for design purposes, but when a storm is coming. coming. And we're going to block off these, uh, these canals at the, where they meet the lake with hydraulically actuated gates, but they're not going to be finished for the 2006 hurricane season, the year after Katrina. They're going to have to be lowered into place with tall cranes. And those cranes cannot operate in high winds. So we need to know from this AdCERC model, when are the winds going to reach 25 miles per hour because we can't run the cranes? And when is the water surface elevation going to achieve a certain threshold value that's going to cause us to, to close these gates? And we don't want to close the gates unless we have to, because we need to have them open to pump out rainwater. So that was the those were the decisions that we had to support. And that's sort of where we got started. We had a comparatively modest mesh. This is a, we call it the Lake Pontchartrain forecast system uh, mesh. It had 77,000 nodes, the modern, Texas mesh has, I think, 5 million vertices, just, and almost all of those are in Texas. So you can see this is, we were only looking at really like Pontchartrain. Uh, the, the workflow, uh, we take this cone of uncertainty that you see on TV on the Weather Channel, and um, we take the parameters. All we have is that is narrow parameter set that I described before. Out of the advisory, we turn that into a wind field, and then we turn that wind field into uh, a set of hydrographs uh, for each of those locations. And so that contains not just the height of the water, but when that, that water height is going to occur. Uh, the great thing about, um, about having a parametric vortex model compared to a gridded wind field is that we can do, it's really easy to do variations. For example, if, if, if there's a concern about rapid intensification, uh, we can increase the winds, the maximum wind speed over, uh, over what the hurricane center is predicting pretty easily, but just by ch changing the Vmax at each point. So it's kind of a, it's kind of a blessing in disguise to have, um, to have a small set of parameters because a small set of parameters can be easily changed, and then we just regenerate the wind field. Also, the R max, that radius to maximum winds, that can be easily changed. So we can look and see if a storm um, is you know, if we're worried the storm is going to get bigger, uh, we can look at that as well. And we do these in real time in consultation with what the tropical meteorologists are telling us and in consultation with what our clients and stakeholders are telling us they're concerned about. They may be concerned about rapid intensification, they may not. And so we, we vary the scenario package, each advisory, the advisories come out every six hours based on those, those <clears throat> needs and those concerns. Whereas the Hurricane Center uses a static set of historical statistics to determine the way they provide that sort of guidance. It's not, it's not tailored to the, the current situation as it's unfolding. Okay, so we didn't, so after 2006, we built the system, we had, we had automation, uh, we didn't have much in the way of communicating with our, our, our clients at, at the Corps of Engineers in New Orleans. Um, we, I was, I had made some pretty basic uh, 
line graphs and it would the automated system would was that was running on the supercomputer would uh, automatically post process the results and send them some pretty basic line graphs and uh, and so so then we had and that was fine for a couple of years it was pretty quiet actually after the 2005 hurricane season uh, until we got to the 2008 hurricane system hurricane season and we had hurricane gustav and what we found was um, the Corps of Engineers, uh, once they got this information, they had these hydrographs. It was something that they really needed. And so an advisory would come out and they would say, oh, this is great, but we have this other area, you know, outside of the of Lake Pontchartrain and in, in sort of in the coastal, the sound outside uh, near Mississippi. And we have some locations there that, you know, that, you know, there's sandbags out there and it's vulnerable and we're redoing the, we, we're redoing it and it's under construction. and what if the storm goes that way? Can you give us guidance there? And so, you know, then the next advisor would come out six hours later and they would say, well, we have some, the Harvey Canal on the west bank of the Mississippi and there's all these floodgates there that we need to know whether those should be closed. Um, can you give us guidance there? And so I was rewriting my post processing system at, you know, at midnight on a Saturday, Saturday night trying to, uh, you know, accommodate these requests. We, we sort of ran into this, this situation of, do you just focus on what's on the scope of work and say, well, too bad, you know, we can't touch it. <laughs> it's very, it's very dangerous to touch this workflow in the middle of the storm. Or do we just do whatever it takes to make sure that they, they get the guidance that they need. And so we made the decision at that time, we're just going to do whatever it takes. You know, if we have to rewrite our system, we're going to rewrite our system. <clears throat> and then, so Gustav made landfall and, and um, you know, we, we did whatever it took and, and we provided good guidance for them. And then uh, uh, Dr. Clint Dawson, uh, here comes Hurricane Ike. And I was still, Ike started having bigger impacts in Louisiana than Gustav did. And Ike never even made landfall in Louisiana. And so it was such a huge storm. And so I was trying to help the Corps and I was working with uh, Dr. Dawson and I was, it was like trying to ride two bicycles at the same time. And so we just said, you know, we, and also all this sort of out of scope requests from the client. Uh, we said, we've got to rethink what we're doing here. Uh, it was just supply creates demand. Once you start supplying these things, uh, then people sort of come out of the woodwork that you never heard of um, and, uh, and, and ask for all kinds of things that you didn't even know about. And so we just needed to rethink. Um, Marcus, is there a question? I know there's just uh, someone um, complimenting the graphics in the chat. So. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Thanks. So we said, okay, let's, let's, what are we doing here? We need to, to have a different system. It was not, the system I wrote was all specified. It was all sort of hard coded for a particular supercomputer and a particular mesh and a particular set of points that we wanted to look at. It didn't have any way of really getting the results out there. I was just emailing individual people with these kind of hokey little line graphs. It wasn't flexible. Um, it wasn't relocatable. It had so we wanted something that was reliable, capable, pluggable. We didn't want to, you know, get get roped into certain types of, of inputs and outputs. We want to have that all pluggable. It needed to be collaborative. We couldn't do it alone. We also needed to rethink about it in terms of what are we really doing? Are we really just taking a model that you could just run yourself by hand and just writing a script around it? Or are we sort of creating this conduit for new, new innovations and new developments to be put into practice? And I think that's, you know, that's the big picture here is we're taking research and putting that into practice and we're creating a, a system for doing that continuously. And not only that, but once you get, it gets out into the field, people, are, people look at it and they have to make decisions with it. And they say, well, this is missing, or I don't believe this water surface that you have over here or um, why can't it be done this other way? Or here's this other decision we need to make that this that what you have doesn't quite cover. And so that all needs to get fed back into the research process. And so this is this is an example here on the bottom of a sort of a mini summit that we had. Um, you see Clint Dawson here in the front. Uh, this is at, at, at TAC, uh, over here at TAC. We have the TAC people there, Gordon Wells, who's at the UT Center for Space Research and also works in the Texas State Operations Center. 
uh, doing decision support whenever there's an event, not just hurricanes either, but all kinds of emergency events. Uh, we got together the HPC people, the research scientists, the emergency operations people, uh, and the modelers, modelers all in one, one room to talk about um, how we're going to make this pipeline work, both getting the research and operations and getting the operational decisions back into research. So um, you have these light bulbs, that's all the ideas uh, that, that Clint Dawson and others come up with of how to make things uh, improve things in terms of physics and, uh, and the way, way it all gets done. Uh, here on the bottom left, you see the ASGS, which takes in all these sort of components in a pluggable way and produces a whole variety of outputs. And then here on the bottom right, this is a group of feet. Um, they're the ones that, that are sort of, uh, you know, they're our end user, they're our stakeholder. They look at the results and, um, and they use that to make life and property decisions. In terms of collaboration, uh, we collaborate with LSU, with UT Austin, with the Renaissance Computing Center in North Carolina, uh, Florida Institute of Technology, uh, George Mason University. We have a wide variety of academic collaborators who are coming up with um, coming up with those innovations, and also they know their their region, they know their the physics of their part of the coast, and um, and they provide that key um, key experience. In terms of visibility, we're not list blue, um, <laughs> sending people hydrographs uh, in a zip file through email. Uh, we our main uh, dissemination uh, partner is at LSU, uh, the CIRA site. Um, I've got the URL there. Uh, CIRA stands for Coastal Emergency Risk Assessment. The neat thing about about CIRA is that it's operational. It understands natively adsorc output. It's designed to accept. Uh, results from the Adsorc Search Guidance System and understands the different wind model types. It understands uh, the different scenarios and what they mean and is able to present those in a way that allows people to explore data. It also aggregates measured data. And so all, each one of those points is a high gauge or a meteorological station. And so you can look at the model and the way it's performing uh, in different layers of the model in terms of winds uh, or water level or inundation above ground. And uh, you can look at the, at the, it also integrates data from, from NOAA. And so the global forecast data is on there as well. And so I encourage you to, to check that out and, and you can get an account. If you just look at the front page and you don't have an account, you'll only get the very basic information that comes from NOAA. If you want our real-time model guidance information, including you can click a button and download shape files to, if you're looking at this in GIS as well. So I encourage you to apply for an account. Uh, we wanted it to be portable and scalable. It runs on uh, it runs on my desktop machine. It runs on my laptop. It also runs on supercomputers, uh, so it scales. And uh, actually, the latest version of AdSec version fifty five is much more scalable uh, in terms of scaling down. It, it used to be quite difficult to solve a full full field scale problem on your desktop or laptop, but with the latest version of AdSearch, you can solve much larger problems on many fewer processors because you can take a much larger time step. So we're really excited about that. I'm integrating that into the latest version of, version of ASGS now. Um, I'm also integrating the uh, Clint Dawson's uh, Edserpolate uh, technology, which allows us to switch on the fly from a coarse mesh to a fine mesh. And that also includes switching from a, a large time step to a smaller one. So um, that improves scalability uh, even further. Uh, in terms of pluggability, we made a whole bunch of changes after the 2008 hurricane season, and then the deep, deep water horizon oil platform blew up uh, in the Gulf and created an oil spill. And uh, we were collaborating with, uh, with Clint and uh, Johannes Westrink and Rick Ludic and Gordon Wells at the Center for Space Research. Uh, we were downloading, uh, so, so at the Center for Space Research, they were digitizing the extent of the spill from satellite photos. And then uh, Dr. Casey Dietrich, uh, who was, a, I think, a postdoc at the time working with, with Clint, uh, had a, a particle tracking model that would put particles as an initial condition where the satellite uh, photo uh, digit, digitization boundaries were. And then we would put that into the AdSERC model and, the AS, and automate it with the ASGS and, and track the spill in real time and uh, got an NSF rapid grant to do it and uh, we're advising various agencies. This is a, a visualization out of the paper uh, that 
the PCD trick was the lead author on looking at, at, at the accuracy and it was about 70% accurate. It was, it's a very difficult thing to do because if the cloud goes by your initial condition will not be perfect. Um, NOAA does spill tracking all the time and they they do a fantastic job of it, but their, their spill tracking model didn't have a couple things that we did have. Uh, it didn't include the tides, so you couldn't see uh, the tidal currents in their in their results. It didn't get that close to shore, so you couldn't see any oil going into the back bays. And um, it didn't have hurricane vortex winds in it. So if a one of the scenarios we looked at is what if Hurricane Ike comes back? And uh, we were able to actually simulate that and showed that it would be really bad news. Uh, a storm like Ike would drive this oil all the way down the the coast of Louisiana west all the way to Texas and get oil all over all over the Louisiana coast. As it was with prevailing winds, um, it looked like the spill was mostly going to go and handle, and that's the advice that we gave the Coast Guard, which turned out to be good advice. Flexibility, uh, we can run on many different meshes on many different machines all at the same time. Uh, this is, I think we have four different meshes here running on two different machines. Each one of them has a different scenario package. Uh, this one has the official forecast. Uh, this is for Hurricane Isaac, uh, which was in 2012. Uh, you see the official, whoops, the official forecast track uh, and the veer left track. So uh, we can tell people what they're looking at in either case. So uh, the flexibility that we wanted to achieve is where we can collaborate and have multiple people doing multiple things at the same time. Uh, we were able to achieve that. So um, the next uh, big sort of big, there, I could tell war stories all day about every hurricane season, but I'm just gonna hit the highlights. Uh, the 2017 hurricane season was the most expensive in American history. To, I think $298 billion worth of damage. Uh, it had been 10 years uh, since uh, Hurricane Harvey, or since 10 years since there was a major storm to hit Texas, so there was Ike. And then, um, and then we had Hurricane Harvey. It had been 20 years, let's see, uh, no, more than that, 30 years, no, let's see. I think 20 years since a major storm had hit, um, had hit uh, South Florida, which was Andrew. And then we had Hurricane Irma hit that year. And then it had been 80 years since a major storm had hit Puerto Rico and we had Maria. And we had all those sort of record setting storms all in the same year. So it was pretty devastating and FEMA was off their feet and we were off our feet and uh, it was a true test of, of what we were doing. Um, <clears throat> I'm just gonna talk a little bit about the decision support that we, uh, that we used. Uh, so we tell people that we did Hurricane Harvey and we provided official decision support and everyone said, well, did you, that was really bad for Houston and, and so, <laughs> You know, we at the time we weren't doing rainfall forecasting, and so we were doing um, we were doing landfall, and so there are a lot of decisions that had to be made. Uh, the Texas State Operations Center was talking about sending, based on some of the other guidance they were looking at, they were talking about sending a whole bunch of resources down to Corpus Christi for hurricane response and recovery. And looking at the ADSERT guidance and where it was the, the storm was going to make landfall uh, to the west of Corpus Christi, uh, more on the Rockport area. Our guidance was showing that no, don't send things to Corpus Christi because it's not going to be needed. So a whole bunch of, of assets did not get diverted to Corpus Christi and is actually retained and uh, and not sent there. And so that was able that was available for for response in Houston where it was really needed. Uh, looking also looking at our guidance, they were able to keep there's a swing gate at Sargent that that is on the intercoastal waterway that allows, uh, allows barges to get out, fuel barges to get out, and they got a lot more barges out because our guidance is not as conservative as other forms of, of guidance from other agencies. We provide best available guidance. When we put out numbers, it's the best numbers we have. It's not conservative. It's not sort of erring on the side of caution. It's the best guess that we have. And so that really helps, um, helps decision makers to make the best decisions and they, we tell them and we, we take that in account. Um, so another another application of, of the model guidance that we produce uh, during the 2017 hurricane season, Hurricane Irma, uh, FEMA was using our data for rapid damage assessment where they do claims modeling for the National Flood Insurance Program. And they weren't necessarily sure uh, whether they believed our data. You can have a, a, a better mousetrap, but 
in action, they kind of stick with the mousetrap that they have. And so what they said was, well, we have really good data for Hurricane Charlie in terms of what the claims were. And this kind of looks kind of like that. So what we'll do is you give us your, your hindcast, which the hindcast is the sort of after the storm went by and people say what happened, that's the that's model run that represents the hindcast. Uh, we'll take that and you give us one for Charlie and we'll put our claims database up against it. And if, if that shows the level of claims that actually happened during Charlie, then we'll believe that your Hurricane Irma uh, modeling results are correct. And so that was really an interesting interaction. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of uptake from state agencies as well as federal agencies for what we do. Uh, during Hurricane Florence, it's amazing um, how uh, states help each other. This, uh, this is Gordon Wells on the left looking at the, at the SERC results uh, computed in Texas uh, for and appearing on CIRA uh, for Hurricane Florence, which hit North Carolina. Actually, he was uh, providing decision support to Texas Task Force One, which is a swift water rescue team. Uh, Newer North Carolina, which is 30 miles from my house, uh, was heavily inundated with floodwaters during Hurricane Florence. Hurricane Florence went right over us. And so um, they needed to know where to park uh, their trucks and their boats and everything so they could start rescuing people, rescue thousands of people from the floodwaters. Um, so they needed to know uh, where to set up their, their staging areas. And so this is Gordon Wells in the Texas State Operations Center giving advice for rescue operation in North Carolina. And so we always tell people that uh, generally people look at the hurricane center data when they're pulling people out or doing evacuations and they tend to look at our data when they're sending people in. So the 2020 hurricane season was um, not as expensive as the 2017 hurricane season, although it was top five. Uh, it was the busiest season we've had in a, in a hundred years. Uh, we had 30, 30, um, 30 hurricane or 30 events, 30 named storms. We had 11 hurricanes, uh, five landfalls in Louisiana alone. Uh, we had 10 storms, a record 10 storms that uh, went underwent rapid intensification. Uh, it was incredibly busy and it was all focused on the Gulf. So just looking at that, uh, Hurricane Laura was the most intense hurricane ever to make landfall in Louisiana. Uh, Hurricane Hanton made landfall in South Texas. <laughs> All this activity in, 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 uh, in the Gulf of Mexico actually caused uh, a lot of the coastal armoring to be, even though there was only, there were only a couple storms that hit Texas and they were not like level storms or, or Harvey level storms, that sort of constant chronic uh, wind wave action in the Gulf of Mexico um, caused a lot of the coastal protection revetments along the Texas Gulf Coast to be exposed and now they have to be repaired. And so it's not just <clears throat> the big storms that cause damage, it's the accumulation of just this chronic chronic storm energy that a hurricane can be thought of as a heat engine that, that converts the thermal energy of the water into mechanical destruction of the coastline. And so that, that mechanical destruction really took a toll in Texas, even though um, it wasn't uh, as epic as, as something like Ike or, or Harvey. So just to give you an idea, um, you know, we, we were flat out from May 15th when the first storm formed until, min, until mid November. Uh, 30 named storms is a lot. Uh, it was the first time since 1935 that there were two storms in the Gulf of Mexico at the same time. So I'm just going <laughs> to just look at that as a snapshot. Uh, we did, we had uh, four ASGS, Edsurg Surge Guidance System ASGS. We had four ASGS operators on seven separate supercomputers at three different supercomputer centers uh, and three CIRA operators across two different data centers uh, providing guidance to the state of Louisiana and the state of Texas and the federal government. And then just in one week for, for these two storms, we ran over 547 answer scenarios. So, and that's just for these two storms. You know, there were 30 storms in all, so it was incredibly busy. Uh, we could not have done it without Frontera at Attack and Stampede 2 and Lone Star 5. Um, it, it was incredible uh, the amount of support that we got and they just bent over backwards uh, to just give us everything, anything and everything that we needed. And so um, it, was, it was a very successful season, but it was very busy for all. <laughs> Every ounce of, of computing and human resource that we had to throw at it. 
So that's those are the storms, and so that you know we the for that we're computing what wind and water level, and so that's that's one level of of decision support. But if you don't know if you know the water height and you know the wind speed, but you don't know what your vulnerability is, you're not really solving the full problem. And so there's a lot of ways to get into what and what we're working toward in, in the middle of is is consequence, what they call consequence modeling, and whether that's um, you know, if, if someone tells you that the the water level at your house is going to be five feet above mean sea level, do you know the elevation of your of your slab on grade or your your crawl space? Uh, if you don't know that, then you don't really know how that's going to affect you. And so, knowing how the wind and the water level uh, are going to affect your structure or your piece of critical critical infrastructure is called consequence modeling. What are the consequences of these, of these hazards? And so just as an example, uh, at Rice University, they've been collecting, and also at University of Houston, they've been collecting uh, these uh, locations of above ground storage tanks among many other pieces of civil in infrastructure in the Houston Ship Channel. So there's these big cylindrical tanks that, that hold all sorts of uh, <laughs> national security sensitive level um, substances. And um, if those, those big cylindrical tanks look pretty sturdy, but the reality is if they're not full, um, they can be crushed by flood water. And if they get crushed by flood water, they can release what's inside. So you have to know where they are and you have to know how deep the water is to know where you, that there's a chance of a spill. Uh, the Coast Guard, uh, Houston Galveston uh, Coast Guard was telling us that um, they had a situation in, in, the, in Galveston Bay where there was a buried storage tank that wasn't full and it had natural gas. And when it got inundated, it's fine when it's not inundated, but once it gets inundated, it becomes buoyant. And it actually popped up out of the water during, uh, during the storm and a boat hit it and it exploded like something out of a movie. And then they had to respond to a marine fire. And so there's all kinds of issues related to how the, how the wind and the water level affect these critical infrastructure. And so that's something that, that we're working towards uh, collaborating with uh, you know, it's very expensive to collect these data sets and they're very valuable. And so we want to collaborate with organizations like Rice and the University of Houston and, and um, Clint Dawson's lab to, to, act, to make that data actionable. And we're not just doing it in Nexus, we're doing it elsewhere. It's also, um, this is the Stevenson Disaster Management Institute at LSU. They have, they have a whole dashboard related to consequence modeling. They've got every hospital, nursing home, gas station, um, hotel, roadway, everything, uh, a database of all those critical assets. And they take our wind and water level data and they produce briefings for um, the uh, Governor's Office of Homeland Security Emergency Preparedness in, in Louisiana. So we're, that's a great, uh, a great relationship as well. Uh, even you not, don't normally think of Rhode Island as being a place where there are a lot of tropical storms and there's not. But um, this is Providence, Rhode Island, they actually built a hurricane barrier in Providence after a hurricane that they had in the 1950s. And they have the same problem if it, and it's not just hurricanes really, it's nor'easters, it's probably a much bigger threat there. But, but it's similar where if a storm goes by and there's a lot of rain and they close this hurricane barrier to keep the water up, I mean, it flooded downtown Providence really badly. And so they wanna keep that out, but if they close those gates, and then it rains and the topography is pretty steep. It's, it's uh, if it rains, it's, it's that water's coming. And, um, and then if the gates close, it's just gonna pile up and it can cause a worse flood with the gate closed than it, they, it would with the gate open. And so they need to make decisions about that and they need wind and water level in real time to be able to do that and also the timing. So, um, so the consequences are important um, and just, I kind of want to finish up with this. Uh, we had our first uh, Texas Adcirc week. This is not the whole group. We had a different group each day. I think uh, some of the people on this call see themselves in the audience uh, and give a shout out. I don't want to, you know, expose you or anything, but um, uh, we had a great, a great group there. This is part of the group. It's not the whole group. Um, one person I will call out here is Amin Kiagati. He's now at the Texas Water Development Board. Uh, I think he's the head of their uh, real-time uh, storm surge and, and hazard forecasting. Uh, they have a huge project, and so he's part of that. It's great to work with them. I think he was a, a postdoc working with Clint at the time that this was taken. So we do these events. Um, it would be great to 
be able to return to Texas uh, to continue to do that. And so it's not really consequence modeling, but it is, um, you know, there are consequences to modeling. And so it's great to uh, to get together and, and talk to people and provide education and, and get feedback and, and build professional networking as well. All right. Um, that's it. Uh, thank you, everyone. I hope I didn't go over time. It looks like I'm pretty close. Um, thank you for inviting me. I really appreciate it. And um, please let me know if you have any questions. Uh, will a link to this recording be sent out at some point? Yeah, yeah. So it'll be um, it'll be posted on the Cyan Chapters YouTube page, and that link will be um, sent out. So. So Jason, uh, nice talk. Under, so under the hood, is it is it Python scripting or what scripting? How do you you know? Uh, yeah, it's a combination. It's a combination. So the the design philosophy is that everything should be self contained, and um, we try to use the minimal technology as that we can because complexity is the enemy of reliability. And so um, it's Perl, most of the, you know, the sort of the, mm -hmm. the, the things that are parsing advisories of things are written in Perl, and then it's all held together with a shell script. It's a bash script. Okay. And so, and it all has to run on the, um, so each, each instance of the ASGS runs independently. So for example, if we have one set up on Frontera, then um, we have a, a bash script on Frontera and we can run multiple ones on the same machine that does everything from downloading the advisory to constructing the input files, to constructing the queue scripts, submitting the jobs, monitoring them, uh, you know, according to whatever scenario package you, you've designed. Uh, and then, um, you know, post executing post-processing scripts and that sort of thing. So the hard, hard parts are done in Perl and the sort of job control is done with the shell script. And that was an intentional choice back in 2006 that we, we've kept with because, um, you know, we could go fancy, we could have, uh, you know, something much fancier, but the reality is we, you want to keep it as simple as possible. And so that's what we've done. Can you all hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Hey, Jason, uh, great presentation. And man, it was so tiny on that Thank picture. You. Uh, so I have a couple of questions. Uh, the first one is you, in one of your slides, you showed the river, the river inflows to the ad circ model for the real time prediction. What is the latest update on the compound flooding and then including river inflow? Um, well, that depends on who you ask. There's, you know, compound flooding is an extremely popular topic. There are many different people working on it. Um, this year, we're going live with a, a, a model that there's a, in Louisiana, there's a model, small system called CFIGS, Compound Flood Inundation Guidance System. And it's basically using the HECRAS model as the overland flood model and with ADCERT results from ASGS as its downstream boundary condition. And those results will be on CIRA, but it's just starting, it's only, of, it's a few, I think, three or four watersheds in Louisiana. And is it so, like a uh, whole, uh, model or is it going to be like two models just running separately? It's going to be two models running separately. It's going to be a HECRAS model that uses the ADCERC results as its downstream boundary condition. Um, so it's not, it's not like they're not running in the same executable like ESMF or something like that. They're separate. Do you have any plan to make that happen? Like, you know, at least, you know, get some inflow input for the ad circ model from whatever hydrologic or hydraulic model? I would love to do that. Um, you know, on the operational side, everything has to, to be, uh, you know, the, the research has to be pretty much done. And I don't know of any research efforts which are at the level, uh, you know, there's people coupling things in the water model, but it's still a matter of, you know, the national water model is one thing and then the ADSERC model is something else or it, whether it's schism or whatever it is. And so, or Delft 3D. And so um, I think it's very much, I mean, Clint would, yeah, Clint would, would be the one to sort of give you the state of the art on the modeling in terms of 
fully integrated coupled model. It's, ex <coughs> excuse me, it's extraordinarily difficult to do, as you know, because, um, you know, the physics of overland flood and coastal ocean are totally different physics. And so, and, and you know, as you have inundation greater, you know, or lesser or coming in or, or, or draining out, uh, the, if you look at any sp specific region or any node in your mesh, the types of physics that apply there are change depending on the depth of the water. And, and, and so you're solving different equations. And so it's really super hard to do. Okay, and uh, my other question is, do you have any plan to reduce the computational time or computational cost of this operational model? Yes, absolutely we do. Absolutely. Um, so this latest version of AdCirc version 55, which was released in February, um, I am running meshes that used to require a one second time step. Uh, I'm now, like, there's one that's 300,000 nodes um, or 600,000 nodes. Actually, uh, we have a mesh at 600,000 nodes that I can run, you know, a five day forecast on 16 processors and you know, 20 minutes or something with ad search. Oh, uh, the global great. modeling, yeah, oh yeah, it's great. Uh, with the caveat that it doesn't do inundation. So if you have- Oh, no wetting and drying, off, basically. No wetting and drying. You have to cut it off the high tide line. Um, if you, so so the folks at Notre Dame are doing global, global uh, modeling. They have a global yeah. mesh, which is 8 million nodes. Um, and a, they run a three day forecast on 72 processors, and I think it finishes in 10 minutes. But again, mm, interesting. so what you do is you wait until the storm gets close, and, and Clint has developed this at, at Serpol 8, where you yeah. wait until the storm gets close and you can have a large time step, and then you switch to a, a denser mesh that has a smaller time step, but overall you're saving a lot of computational time. So as a follow-up question, like personally on your like uh, professional opinion, do you think the state of Texas needs a designated high-performance computational center just for flooding? Um, I would I would say I would say that no. I would say that TAC does that really well. They just got a bunch of they just got an upgrade from the NSF for what they call urgent computing. Um, they got money from the NSF to add on to their facilities to do uh, urgent computing. The thing about having your own dedicated HPC is what do you do when there's no storm? You know, you don't need it. And that's the same problem with cloud computing. Cloud computing is great for scalability and capacity, but you can't just run your stuff there every day. It's super expensive and it's, it's not needed. So the way to do it is to have relatively modest computing power that you use on a day-to-day -day basis and then have a way to scale up when there's a big event going on and and you can't afford that scaled up capacity yourself it's i don't think it's an efficient use of capital i think tac is is fantastic and, and cloud is a great way to go as well but um and tac is is totally um totally on board and they'll you know they're totally they're great people to work with and so that's what i would focus on and I have two more questions and I will combine them. The, the first one is about like any latest update on the AdSec 3D, if it ever comes to the operational mode. And the, the, the last one is, uh, what is the plan for updating the mesh to include all the latest bathymetry and topography data and also the land use and land cover data? Um, <clears throat> let's see, so uh, let, me, let me start with the second one. Uh, in terms of uh, keeping things updated, the, it's very expensive to do. And so uh, a lot of the meshes that we use were not developed by us, by FEMA for flood insurance studies. So they, they will collect all that data, they will collect the survey data and they will run a flood insurance study with 500 hypothetical storms. Um, the Corps of Engineers does this. They had a Texas Coast Comprehensive Study where they update all the roadways and, and all those sorts of things. And, and Dr. Dawson um, participates in those those studies as well, and has, has worked on a lot of those too. And so it's generally a state and or federal agency that pays for all for all those updates, and they do it on a periodic basis to keep that up to date for future studies, or at least they have been. And then, the, could you repeat the first question that you had? Uh, what is the latest on Aztec 3D, and then do you yeah. have a plan to bring that to the operational mode or not? No. Um, 
Sorry. Uh, so AdCERC 3D, um, I know that Dr. Dawson has worked on that. Uh, several other researchers have worked on that and developed different parts of it. I don't know that a pr funded project has come along to take all of those improvements and fold them back into the, the code proper. Um, it's for the 3D is very valuable for certain things that are not storm surge. And, it's, no. and the 3D uh, is help for, helpful for uh, navigation because you need Salinity. the water level or the water. Yeah, the salinity and the water velocity at different levels. Um, different types of spills, uh, you know, plastic pollution or different types of oil spills. Uh, the 3D can be important. But generally for our applications uh, related to storm surge model guidance, uh, the 3D it does prove the answers enough to make it worth the additional computational cost. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. I just had a quick question. I don't want to take it too far over time, but um, okay. so you mentioned the um, when when you were looking at, at some point you were looking at Florida and, and they asked you to um, to do a hindcast to sort of um, validate with some results that they had to kind of confirm that, that they could be confident in the model. And so I was just wondering, like, what were the results of that? Like, did it did it agree well with what they wanted, and then it was easy to convince them, or did, was there some more back and forth? Um, I actually just had a meeting uh, with somebody about that today. Um, they consider the AdCERC uh, Heincast to be kind of the gold standard of Heincast. And there's really not much, you know, the other op option they have is the slosh model from the Hurricane Center, which is not as, as refined in terms of resolution. And the wind model is not as sophisticated as what we have in AdCERC. And, I, and they, up, they do a pretty good job of going around and trying to update the, the bathymetry and the topography. But, um, but it's, again, there's only so much they can do with the, with the resolution. Uh, and then, um, you know, their model is designed to be conservative. In other words, if you have, always have a band of uncertainty, well, they, they err on the side of a more severe event. That's sort of their, kind of their policy. And they've, basically openly stated that. And so that's not what we do with AdCERC. We provide the best numbers we possibly can, our best best judgment and best modeling. And that may be a little bit high in places, it may be a little bit low, um, but but we focus on best available guidance. And so so they kind of consider ad, the AdCERC kind of has to be the gold standard. So I, I guess the short answer is they ended up leaving us. And is that something that you've done before or how do you generally deal with like the, when, when people are, you know, asking for more confidence or are sort of like, you know, asking you to confirm the validity? Yeah. Um, you know, like I said, we could tell a million war stories. Every, every season has multiple storms and multiple things happen and, and different, we have different experiences. It's always an adventure. Um, and one of those stories is after Hurricane Isaac, um, which was in, in 2012 in Louisiana. And we had been telling people, you know, sort of at the state, um, you know, the National Guard who's involved in emergency response, <clears throat> we'd been saying, you know, here's this new model, and then we know we haven't, that you haven't used it before. And, and their, their point was that they wanted to, you know, they're, they're used to the weather service data, that's official data, they're used to it, they know it, they talk to the weather service weather forecast offices. So they weren't, weren't really interested in this new stuff. And then uh, Hurricane Isaac came and there's a town called Laplace, which is in the Mississippi River on one side and Lake Pontchartrain on the other. And everybody in Laplace said, you know, we never flooded. We never flooded in Katrina and we never flooded in Rita. And, and this is a kind of a common thing that you see in communities where people say, well, how, bi how bad is the storm? Well, if we didn't flood during Katrina, this, this Isaac, which is what, a cat two? It's not going to do anything to us, <clears throat> but it totally depends on the, on the specific circumstances. And Isaac made a dog leg to the west, and they ended up rescuing 3,000 people out of Oplas in the middle of the night. And Adsir predicted that in advance, and actually they, they went back, and uh, uh, I showed the, the dashboard they have in Louisiana. That was made by Brant Mitchell, who's 
at SDMI now, he was he was a captain or a colonel, I think, in the, in the National Guard. And he did a post post hoc analysis of the ADSERC predictions. And he, he found that 90% of the businesses that ADSERC predicted would flood 48 hours in advance did flood. And so from then on, he was like, you know, we need to use this ADSERC model. This is this is the way to go. And so, and then we had the same thing with the Coast Guard and, and during Hurricane Irene in 2011. People on the ground who make these decisions are used to, you know, working with the Weather Service. They will not really migrate to anything new until they see it for themselves in their local area. And so we, our system has kind of grown not by, you know, papers written, although that's really important, um, and not by, you know, going out in box, although that's really important. It grows when there's a storm in an area and they see the difference that we can make in their lives. I mean, they had a radio tower. They lost radio communication during Hurricane Isaac in Louisiana. And they said, if we had known, if we had been looking at these ADSERC results that we had access to, we would have sandbagged that radio tower and we would have maintained radio communication. And that makes a big impact to them. And so we sort of grow by disasters. And the same thing with Irma and Florida with FEMA and all that. We, we grow by disasters. That's what makes believers out of people. So that's, if there's no storm, you can talk, but you, you know, they're just, they're gonna say, well, we'll stick with what we know. So that's sort of how those uncertainties get dispelled. Thanks. I think there are, there are a couple of sort of career related questions that Absol is asking. Um, I'm not, I'm not sure if these are very like general or specific to like the ASGS group, but um, he was asking about what, um, yeah, he says, what do they look for in general computational science candidates and what are the potential computational science tools they are planning to work on in the future? Um, for example, using machine learning, state-of-the-art HPC tools. Yeah, like I said, I'm not sure if he's specifically talking mm -hmm. about the ASGS group, but um, maybe if you can address that. Right. Yeah, so we, we look for someone who has, um, uh, you know, technical expertise is really important, um, but it can't be, you know, we're in, we're in industry, we're not, we're not academics. And so we're looking for someone who wants to see what they're doing put into practical use and has that mindset of, you know, this is not an academic problem. This is something that people are really going to rely on. And so that's, that's sort of the technical skills are important, but also that mindset of, of helping people and helping people make life and property decisions and, and um, that real world impact. That's, that's an important kind of soft skill to have. Um, and as far as the specific tasks, <clears throat> we're doing a lot more validation uh, as we commercialize things. Uh, we are taking this data and we are, you know, getting it out there a lot more than we have in the past. And in, in terms of, you know, when you're dealing with an insurance company or, uh, you know, anyone who has, a, you know, a critical infrastructure, they're go going to want to know, or even court cases, lit litigation, um, expert testimony, that you can show them data, but they're going to want to know how good is this data. And we have to be able to quantify that. And we need to be able to quantify it as the storm is moving. And so one of the things we're working on now is real-time validation. And that's statistical as part of it. Um, I would be open to looking at machine learning for, for that sort of thing, AI. Um, there's a lot of things you, that I would like to do with AI. Um, I think a way that we can, I can think of a few ways that I'm not gonna mention on this call, but um, that we can accelerate what we're doing in terms of AI where there's different ways of running the model and different models you can run uh, in, in different circumstances. Like uh, if it's raining, and uh, the storm is coming, uh, a hurricane, um, which do we need to run our rainfall runoff model or do we not? Uh, it's too expensive to sort of run every model you have just in case. Uh, it would be nice to have an AI that could say, well, um, you don't need to work as hard, you know, on this part of the modeling as you do on that part. And so uh, this model won't, won't need to run or it only need to run once a day, or it can run in a certain mode that's, uh, that can build a lot faster. Um, without a model or having to make those decisions themselves. And so I think um, AI has, has, has a space where it can help us configure our, our models to make them uh, run faster and only run the things that we need to run. 
Um, and I think um, machine learning can help out a lot in terms of valid real-time validation. We also have a lot of analysis work that we do just with the winds. And, um, and there's also visualizations. I showed you some of the visualizations, those sort of uh, vortices turning and things like that. That's actually out of my analysis package I wrote uh, to sort of look at the winds and what they're doing and how they corresponded. So a person who, who did 3D visualization um, could help us a lot, explain to clients what we're doing and why and what it looks like, because you can talk until you're blue in the face, but um, it's much easier to show somebody rather than, than tell them about it. And so that's, that's interesting as well. So I'd say those are the three, three areas. And Jason, uh, have you ever considered working with other models than AdCirc, like Dell 3D or Schism? Or do you have any comments on that? Yes, those absolutely. Uh, um, I don't really have any comments on those models. I think those are all really interesting models. Um, Delft has its own uh, sort of automation system called Delft Fuse, flood early warning system. Um, from what I understand, it's, it's, uh, it's proprietary. Um, and I actually met one of the Deltaris guys at a, at a conference and uh, at a poster session. <clears throat> and the question he had was, why do you run the model yourself? Why don't you just set up an operation center and teach people how to run the model and, and have them do it? Because that's what Deltaris does with, with Delft 3D. Because they go around to different, different organizations and install their stuff and they teach people there how to use it and then they, they walk away and they're done. And so that's just what they do. And he wondered why we didn't do that. And I said, it's because we only work with people who have no interest or, or infrastructure in running their own model. Um, you know, the, the organizations that we with, work with, you know, the state of, you know, the, you know, this, the states generally don't want to run their own model. Um, you know, a Department of Transportation is not going to have their own storm surge model that they run. It's too expensive to keep somebody on staff to do that. <clears throat> so, so that's a main difference we do versus what, what they do. What well, um, excuse them? You know, Schism has its own real-time system called WIF, Water Information Forecast Framework. Um, I believe that's developed in Europe, Portugal, or it's developed by the EU. I don't know much about that. Um, I think Schism is a cool model. One of the differences with Schism um, versus AdCirc is a lot of what's in Schism you compile in. And so there's some different ways that it's, that it's used. Schism has a lot of really neat features. Um, actually, the Department of Water Resources in California has a really sophisticated schism model of the San Francisco Bay. The San Francisco Bay has storm, sort of feeds into, uh, it goes into the valley and it sort of feeds into the water, the fresh water that comes down from the mountains and sort of travels north-south. And then you have the seawater coming in from the west and there's all these hydraulic structures and there's all these canals and there's saltwater intrusion, <clears throat> and there's gates that have to be open and closed. It's very similar. So they built this offline model, and I can't imagine how much money they spent on it. But um, Schism has some neat properties with that, and um, they're talking about building a real-time forecasting system around their existing sort of model that they operate, you know, sort of on a case-by-case -case basis. They want to build automation around that. And now, I don't, you know, I don't know about how that's going to go, but it would be neat to be able to be involved in that sort of thing. Um, but we haven't made any real motions in that direction, but that's definitely something that, that we could accommodate. Thank you. All right, well, I guess if there are no other questions, um, yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Fleming, for your time today during the talk and thank you for the extra time answering questions as well. Um, I think, yeah, it was a, such an interesting talk and, and, and yeah, thank you for so much insight on, on, on your answers to the questions. My pleasure. Thank you very much for inviting me. Yeah, of course. And, and yeah, thanks everyone for attending. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye.